Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Guild Wars 2 Daily. The footage in the background for today comes from me. Uh, we're doing two episodes today because I do desperately want to get the servers finished. But I was doing the countdown today and I just had a lot of questions that I wanted to answer too. So I thought I'm going to have my cake and eat it too and just do two videos for today. So let's continue on. The footage will be me running around the servers as I talk about them. Starting off with Nundu Bay which is again we're still in Nightfall. Hold on. Let me have a look at this. Are all of the... No, not all of the German servers are in Nightfall. I, I think for a while in the game's development, wasn't the first beta, like, certain German ones or French ones or something? They were all just of a specific area of the world. Anyway, uh, yeah, I think the European English ones were all Nightfall, weren't they? Anyway, uh, yeah, Nandu Bay is in Nightfall. Sorry, off of the tangent. And this was... An interesting place in that it was one of those rare occasions in the Guild Wars storyline where you could, if you went off the beaten path, find an outpost, find like a hidden place just on the side. But later on in the plot, far later on in the plot, you would return to that area and you would suddenly realise this was a far more significant place than you originally thought and it actually became a mission hub. That was something I think Nightfall did really well in the... Prophecies felt like an excuse for a world tour. The plot was good, don't get me wrong, but the way it came across as you were playing through the game, you were just running, first of all you were here, and then you went forward in time a little bit in the same place, and then you crossed the mountains, and then you went here, and then you went here, and literally there was never any going back to a region you'd previously been to. It was all, you would finish a region and all of a sudden a character would pop up and it would feel like they were just saying, oh no you need to go here, and it was just like a sudden curve or an excuse to go to a new region in a different place, which felt a bit off and it felt like you were just running around the world on this big tour and the plot was just an excuse to get players to go to different environments so that the gameplay didn't get boring and it felt like that a little bit. The actual lore that's in the game obviously was more complicated than that and I think that it doesn't feel that way if the story is told in the right way which is what I'm hoping to do with the summary but generally while playing through the game that was an impression I feel like a lot of people got. However Nightfall really fixed this. Factions did to an extent in that you would return in factions to the city, to the north, to Kaineng City after a while. So, And you would actually get a choice in factions as well, whether you went to one area and not the other. So it didn't feel like a world tour there, because you could really have missed a massive part of the game if you didn't want to go there. Once you completed the story, you could always return, of course. But it didn't feel like it in factions, and to an extent, I think with factions and Nightfall, this felt this way because they had a lot less time to develop these campaigns, and there were less regions in the first place, so they wanted to make more more use of the regions they developed. Prophecies, by the same token, had a problem in that it had this huge world with all these empty places that Arena ne never made good use of, while in Factions of Nightfall they were quite good. They were, all the areas they had, they made use of very well. So, in Nightfall, you first get off of Istan. When you've declared war on Corner, Istan and Corner go to war. I've just realised on my daily stuff, I haven't talked much about the actual plot of Factions and Nightfall that much, have I? It's been more prophecy stuff. But basically, these two nations go to war because the woman in charge at corner you realize is this crazy bitch that's trying to bring about the end of the world basically and you go to war with her in corner and you are a part of the assault force that goes to invade you try and kill her in her like capital city gandara the moon fortress is this great place but everything goes terribly wrong and you and your forces are scattered all across corner and you need to find refuge so about this time in the plot you go to a place this cave that you find that used to be a temple to duena and you renovate it basically and it becomes your hub your base of operations while you try and get the wounded back to Istan under the corn's nose but while you are in this region of the game early on you can go off the beaten path and you'll find this place you'll find a port called Nandu Bay now Nandu Bay was quite close to a place that some of the early stuff in Nightfall took you to one of the missions when you do finally leave and go back to Istan you the mission ends really close to Nandu Bay this port it pretty much ends there but you never unlock the outpost unless before that mission you just went wandering around and you found this little thing so it was a cool small outpost for the most part that felt a lot like Ice Tooth Cave and Maguma Stade and these other ones I've been mentioning that are just these little nice rewards for players that go out of the way to a place to rest that often you wouldn't find other people but uh, once you'd been there originally and thought ah oh, this is kind of cool there's some stuff going on here very nice you would then continue on on the storyline and far later in the plot after Varish Oss has escaped and she's gone to the desolation to make her pilgrimage and, and to finally bring 
bring Abaddon to the mortal realm, Nightfall's already begun. When this happens, you get a decision to make in Nightfall, as you get many cool decisions. And uh, two of your friends, Koss and Milani, are, but they both have a problem. Koss knows that the Nightfall has spread and that some people have been attacked there in Vabi, which is where you are in the story at the time. And he wants your help protecting this garden. And then at the same time, Milani, who's a dervish who communes a lot with the gods and actually, I, I believe a little bit of the dervish lore hints at this to do with them being a bit more mystical and you that certainly shines through with Milani. Milani's been having terrible nightmares, as might I add, a lot of people had been having during the storyline of Nightfall. Everyone starts having nightmares with these terrible visions and things. And Milani has some of her hometown, which is near Nundu Bay back in Corner, uh, being attacked and she, she realises this whole section the Marga Coast has just been totally ruined and she needs some help. She, she wants you to go and make sure everything's fine at the Marga Coast. But that's a long way away. You have to make a decision. Do you go with Kos where you know there's a threat or do you want to go with Milani who has this possible threat? And the quest is called Heart or Mind and the idea is do you follow your heart and go with Milani who just suspects something's going on or do you go with Kos who's far more logical and is like we should stay here. And it, the decision I will be honest I always made was I will with Koss and indeed I did that in the Let's Play but if you decide to go with Milani you will return here to Nundu Bay and now Nundu Bay becomes a far more important area suddenly you realise oh god this port is actually where you're going to be beginning the mission from it's a very interesting mission in the they never do establish it's quite well done they never do establish whether the place actually was attacked, where the Marga Coast was attacked, because you go to Nundu Bay to meet with this dream weaver, this woman that can read people's dreams, and it's really ambiguous whether the mission that takes place later, where indeed Marga Coast has been attacked and it's all fallen into night, it, they they leave it vague as to whether you've just travelled into Milani's mind to tackle these nightmares and defeat the nightmares, as it were, and remove them from her, or whether actually the vision came to pass, and they're very clever and subtle with the way they write that part of the story, that is very very cool and I'm ashamed to say it went over my head when I first played the game but when you go back and see the circumstances and all the dialogue that goes on there you are supposed to finish that wondering well we've saved the day but did we save the real Marga Coast or did we just destroy these dreams that meant nothing in Milani's head at the end of the day it didn't matter whether it was real or not you'd helped Milani with her mind and now she was able to continue on fighting but you can have interesting discussions there whether if it was just in her mind was it worth the heroes going back there or should they maybe have stayed with Koss and helped him defend the garden where you know there was a serious problem and the Vabians might not have been able to deal with it it's a cool part of the story it's one of the more subtle interesting interesting as far as writing goes, parts in all of the Guild Wars campaigns, which I quite like. As for the outpost itself, Nandu Bay uh, is described as a bustling port on the Marga Coast, used mostly by fishing vessels. Nandu Bay is an idyllic port town in almost every way. Visitors are advised to steer clear of the Corsairs, literally. So it's in kind of Corsair territory, and indeed in the storyline you meet one of the most prominent Corsairs of the whole storyline, Margrid the Sly, quite near there. She's the one who helps arrange you passage back to Istan in the first instance. It's a cool place. To me, it stands out a little bit because this was an outpost I used to uh, leave from. There was a small run you could do to get like elite mesmatomes just out of here by going into hard mode and killing a boss that was near it. So it was a place that I frequented when I wanted certain tomes and I'm sure a lot of people were also aware of that same farm and it might mean something to those guys. It was a cool place though, it really was and it was a subtle thing with the storyline. I just like that it was an outpost you originally go to and then later you realise it's far more significant later on down the line in the plot. And as I say, I enjoyed that about both factions and Nightfall returning to these places but in a satisfying way. It really was quite cool. Uh, the next server, that was a German server, the next server is Cavalon, which is an American server. Cavalon was, we were just talking about Nightfall, now we have to really change gears and go into factions. This place belonged to the Jade Sea. Cavalon is a funny place because in game, obviously for the Guild Wars storyline, everything was frozen in time to an extent. So you would go to an outpost and you would see the outpost as it was in a certain period of time. So you could be in Ascalon, for example, and go to Pekin Square. And in Pekin Square, you would find Baradin standing there and these people hold up there. But really in the story, were they all still stood there nine years later when the, the storyline essentially ended in Guild Wars 1, right at the end of all of the Guild Wars Beyond stuff? Probably not. Baradin certainly wouldn't still be there, but it's frozen in time because of obviously this discrepancy between gameplay and lore. Well, Cavalon is one of the biggest, most fun examples of that in place because Cavalon actually, in the lore, 
It is mostly derelict most of the time. The Luxons, before the Norn were ever in the picture, it was the Luxons that were the, the race or the people, shall we say, in the in the storyline that fulfilled the spot of being constant travellers. So the Norn are nomadic hunters and they don't often form settlements or anything. Well, this is what the Luxons are like very much as well. They, they tend to move and they're always moving about the surface of the waves in the Jade Sea. But Cavalon is like one place that they return to quite often. Well, in fact, once every 10 years, the in-game description reads, although Cavalon is the Luxon's home settlement, most prefer to stay on the move, returning only once every decade when the convocation brings together all of the three armadas. Traders from around the world come to buy precious jade and rare seashells that the Luxon merchants sell here. So what we have in the law here is a place that there's lots of Luxons but only once every 10 years and usually there's not that many people there at all. But in the gameplay, because the convocation happened about the time of factions, you participate in the convocation, it means that there's all these people here in Cavalon, and they're there. And forevermore, while you're in game, Cavalon is this bustling place full of Luxons, even though we're coming up on like a 10-year cycle for the plot of the game, everything considered. But for players, we, we kind of think back on that, and it's easy to think, oh, Cavalon's just like where all of the Luxons hang out. It's not really. They just kind of set up these small places for a short while before moving on. And like, you'll actually see if you walk around in Cavalon, most of the stuff is on giant turtles and it's all very hastily set up and it could be easily taken down again. And that's the idea in the lore. It's just a place in the JT that the Luxons reconvene when the convocation occurs. I mentioned here in the description the three armadas. This isn't so much to do with Cavalon, but that is how the Luxons are organised. They have three different armadas. They don't necessarily always get along with one another. It's quite funny actually because that's quite similar to how the Char work as well with their legions, which is quite funny. You've even got an armada of Luxons that are particularly specialised in creating in creating machinery and stuff and like working with the turtles and it's kind of similar to the Iron Legion with the chart, it's pretty cool. Uh, so it does match up in certain ways, the Luxons are a cool thing to look at when you can see clearly lore that was written before ArenaNet knew they wanted to do the five races and how they overlap with the other races and this is one of the things I think would be interesting when we get into Guild Wars 2, an expansion that takes us to Cantha because as a char you can go and see, even though the Luxons have now been absorbed into the Empire, people by ethnicity's sake do still exist, there are still Luxons in that regard and it'd be interesting to see if anyone still kind of carries on those Luxon traditions and as a char it'd be cool to see how you interact with the Luxons in comparison to how Norn interact with the Luxons because they've all got something in common somewhere down the line. So yeah that's Cavalon anyway it's a massive place a lot of people it's a significant area for people in Guild Wars 1. As I said there was a short window in Guild Wars 1's lifespan where a lot of players really identified with being either Kurzik or Luxon it was the big factions thing and you were really proud of which side you joined. That didn't last very long in Guild Wars 1's case. It was nothing like Horde versus Alliance or anything that you see in most other MMOs. It was much smaller for Guild Wars 1. But while that time did last, if you had chosen the Luxon side, you really would, you'd like Cavalon. That would be up there in your list of favourite places because it's like, yeah, that's that's the main place for me. I'm a Luxon and that's that's the main place where they are. Sadly, at this point in the game, it's mostly empty there of, of players. All the NPCs, of course, are still stood about. But players don't appear that, that much unless they've just kind of finished a uh, a speed clear, a Mount Kinkai speed clear or something to try and get lots of reputation points and then a party might appear of eight people for a very brief moment, they'll trade in their faction and then leave again. So that's Cavalon. it was a cool place, it was a big place in factions and for a short while during the game's lifespan it was quite important to a lot of people. As far as lore, it's got some, that kind of interesting stuff going on there. Also for a while this was the one place that allowed us to get into the elite mission, The Deep. This used to be only available to the alliance that owned Cavalon because this was one of the outposts that alliances could actually take control of or, and you'd need to get ferried in there by someone from that alliance until a change was made later where scrolls became readily available and that was that pretty much. The last server is back to the German side. This is the final German server so hopefully you found one if you're a German listener. Hopefully you found one that you like the idea of. This last one is Riverside. It's simply called Riverside as far as servers go for Guild Wars 2 and in Guild Wars 1 it's another one of those that nothing was ever just called Riverside in Guild Wars 1. We can though I I guess agree that it's not just talking about a random riverside as there were many in Guild Wars 1. There were a lot of rivers in the game. It's actually talking about a specific location in Guild Wars 1 that was called Riverside Province. This was a mission 
back to Prophecies. We've had one of each campaign today. That's quite cool. Over in Prophecies, after you left the Maguma jungle, you returned to Kryta for a short while before going to the Crystal Desert. So the plot at this point was you had joined the Shining Blade, you had killed Hablion, you had betrayed the White Mantle, they had declared war on the Shining Blade. The Shining Blade had now fled and hidden in the Henge of Denravi, and you had been approached by the Vizier of Awe as a member of the Shining Blade with an offer. The Vizier basically had said to the leaders of the Shining Blade, I will give you aid. I am a powerful ass mage. I will give you aid if you help me get the Scepter of Awe. And the reason he goes to you as the Shining Blade is because you, the Shining Blade, have got spies and agents within the Temple of the Unseen, which is where the Scepter of Awe was being kept. Go figure. So, Avinia plans for a party of Shining Blade, which you are a part of, to leave the Henge of Denravi, despite the fact the main force stays there, and in the night, sneak to the Temple of the Unseen. And that's what you do. You sneak out of the Maguma jungle in the dead of night over to the Temple of the Unseen. And that's where Riverside Province is. That's where the outpost is. It's just a small place on the River Ullen, which you'd sailed up to leave the Maguma, and you enter the mission. And the idea of the mission is it's very contrasted. If you don't go for the bonus, the idea is you're supposed to be sneaking past the Watchtowers and stuff. But if you do go for the bonus, you have to just kill everything. Uh, but you sneak through during the mission and find the spy, which is a man named Dinus, that you'd given the Septu to a long time ago, which is quite funny because you never knew he was a spy back then. And now you do know he's one, which was uh, always a nice little thing for me. I enjoyed that bit of the plot. He gives you the scepter and then you run off with it. So that's what happens in the story there. Riverside Province uh, is one of those kind of mid-games prophecies missions that never had anything really stand out about it, which is a bit of a shame. But that whole area of Kryta, I quite like because you never consider, you look at the world map and you don't really consider that that's Kryta. It's so far away from Lion's Arch and what most people consider as being Kryta that it's weird to just go there and then you're like, oh my god, yeah, it actually looks like Kryta. All of the terrain looks like Kryta. And it really is just this brief return to Kryta before you go off to the Crystal Desert after Sanctum K, which is quite cool. As far as Guild Wars 2 is concerned, that whole weird region of Kryta that's like wedged between just above the Tarnished Coast and right next to the Maguma Jungle, right down there in the bottom left, doesn't even seem to really be about, I guess, in Guild Wars 2. The map looks like it's a, a bit different, so it's an interesting place. I wonder what's going on there in Guild Wars 2, actually. Uh, I guess we'll see when we get finally to play as the Asura and the Silvari. But that is Riverside, a reference to Riverside Province, the mission in Prophecies from Guild Wars 1. There you go, guys. That is servers for today. Thank you very much for watching. We're about how... Oh my god, we're not halfway through. Oh my god, we've got a lot of service to do. We have now done all of the German ones though. Uh, I will probably pick up the pace going into the future. Thank you very much for watching guys and I will see you tomorrow. I hope you guys enjoyed the video.